for example, just very briefly, very briefly, there, there are different relationships of neshamas. Neshamas are related in the sense that some neshamas fragment. So the two pieces were once one. Then there are other connections where neshamas don't fragment, but pieces fragment off. They're called mitzutzim. People, you know, much smaller pieces. Pieces fragment off, small sections of it. Then there are cases where the entire neshama goes back down. It all comes go, comes back into a body. You see, what? That's Gilgo. There are many different ways that this thing works. It all depends on a lot. There are a lot of factors here. What the tachlis of the person is, where the, what part of the neshama that tachlis has. It, there are many many questions here, uh, and what what's the best way to massacre it? See, there are a lot of rules here and principles, which is the whole thing itself. But the truth of the matter is, the Ramchal says he says very simply. He says if we can understand, he said. To understand all the interrelationships of all the Shamas is to understand all of human history. Because all of human history is nothing more, you see, than tikkunim that are continuously applied to the Shamas and all their tolders <coughs> and their <coughs> derivations you know, and then the Tritim and Gigurim. That's all human history, you see. You are in this position where you are now. Why? Because you have some Neshama that related to some individual at some point in time and so on. you were that person at some point in time and you did something then or whatever the story was <coughs> and you are not, either you're a Gilgul of him or you're a Nietzsche of him or whatever the story is you see however it works and that you have to massacre in that aspect you see but I believe that once you have to massacre in that aspect you are now will always remain individuated that's what you said about yes. the dark form yes I, I'm not you, you know once the collect, the collective thing becomes fragmented it never re-collects you will, oh, you will be getting to Olam Haba as well, you are. It's much of With your yeah. mind, your consciousness, yourself. I remember from a private town in the Shadow Gold in the beginning, if I remember correctly, he said that there is a lot of fear in answer to the question of which Google will come back to the group yeah. because they're all doing it. To all which is consistent with the idea of the individual entity retains either the volunteer with the Hakova going to go from the Shama, yeah. this is all the way back. It's a separate individual. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, because just that's just that's just you got two guys, right? You just answered that question of all the bulls, who's going to come back? No. Yeah. Okay, you can't put it this way. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. There was a Jewish. The, the study of Ashkof and Jewish history is an interesting thing. And just uh, to do this, uh, what happened was that there was a period of time in the medieval times, uh, there were in the Rishonim, where the Rishonim themselves attempted to understand the Hashkofa. And it's strange to say, from an intellectual standpoint. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu, when Moshe Rabbeinu was on the heart, Moshe Rabbeinu received Kala Torkula. He received all Thai Mitzvahs and their Purushim. In addition, Moshe also received the panemius of the entire Torah in terms of its soid. He also received that. And what he did, when he wrote it down and passed it down, <coughs> he did not pass down the, the soidus, the soidus or the, the, mis- the secrets to all people. Only to certain kinds of people. And these soidus essentially contain the understanding of why things happen in the world. You see. Then, what happened was, along the time, there were many people who were not privy to that particular information for different reasons. <coughs> Not so much because then the Shem wasn't tracked to that, or whatever the story is, they weren't privy to that. So there was a whole group of Rishonim that were never privy to that. And one of them was the Rambam, you have the Abag, you have a whole group of them that were not in that line. So therefore, the Rambam says himself, he says, for example, in the Mon of Ruchim, on the third chelik, he says, the third chelik, he says, I'm about to explain what happened to the Maishim of Yechezkel. Now the Maishim of Yechezkel, which you see often in the Gemara, is a, it's Kabbalah, it's, it's something which is has to do with the mysteries of the Bria, how the, how the body is manai the Bria, you see, and that's in the Maishim of So the Mammam says, I'm going to be mafarish the Maishim of However, I tell you right now, that I am not being mafarish it from that which I have received from my Rebbe, because I have received absolutely no tradition about this, you see. My, no one ever told me the Pshat in the Maishim of But since I'm a Chochem of Neatma, I'm a maiden dumb with the law. I will attempt to put together some rational explanation of what this is. Where did he get this explanation? He got this explanation on the basis of what he knew. He was the Rambam and he was going and he understood Torah and this and that and so on and he learned it. But he also got it from secular subjects. You see. Because the Rambam and many of you at that time felt they learned the Greek studies, <coughs> the Aristotelian metaphysics and so on and they took many of the principles and they worked through with that. At that time that was the current, that was the vogue of knowledge and so on. And that was true until the time of the Ari. 
the one bomb was the one bomb. The one bomb was different. The one bomb already was was received certain certain. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like the one bomb said, like the one bomb said this. Tell you as well. It's competition. That's right. That's right. Yeah, but well, that's you do. He was, and uh, he. There's no reason why not. There's no reason why not. You understand? The, the, the Rambam laid to the sense of the story that MS is MS no matter where it comes from. And the truth of the matter is that the, the Aristotelian approach <coughs> was an extremely profound approach, and there were many things about that approach which were consistent with Torah. And what the Rambam did, he says, let us take this approach and let us work it through and synthesize it with a great deal of Chachm of Torah. And there's a tremendous amount of Torah which, which, which was understood. There's no question about that. But the point is that at the same time there was another tradition, <laughs> you see, where the philosophical questions that Aristotle asked and so on and so forth were answered from the Bunishim himself. You know, see, but no, they didn't have that Kabbalah. You see, this was passed down, you know, it was lost to many journeys, it was lost. The whole thing, how it was a very big, uh, strange thing, how the whole thing occurred. But essentially, what happened in Kaddish world is at the time that we in the 15th century already, Kaddish world went away from that rationalist tradition. You see, and all of Kaddish world essentially accepted the Kabbalah Ari as the the Hasidim, the, the Misnagdim, all of them. There was no deviations. And you find the Sfaris, the Vilna Gaon was the biggest Mukubal of his time, and it's a Misnagd. All the literature, all the Shivas that we have today, the literature Shivas, all, all come from Chaim Vlajan, basically. That's the start of from the Gvar. That's it's all used on that, you see. And all the Hasidim come from the, all, all the, come from the Baal Shem, and both of them were eunuch from the Ari, you see. So, since that time, there was like an Achdus in Kratim Kalisol, and uh, this happened. So, when you say Gilgul, the Rishonim, a Gilgul, the Rishonim, the Rishonim that didn't hold from it, like the, I think there's Rav Sadi going. Because there was no Kabbalah on such a thing. To make up such a Chiddush yourself, you can't do. You can't say that one Neshama comes back later on. Where do you come to say Zadach? You know what I mean? If you're not in the basin of Shemala, how do you know? What, you see it? You know what I mean? So that I couldn't say such a Yisrael. So what was the rationale for saying such a Zadach? What's that? What was the Rambam's rationale? He never said the name of Gilgulam. Rambam Parkett, he went against it. He went against it. So we're saying that didn't have such a Kabbalah, didn't say the name of Google. Because the they did not know, yeah, they did not understand. So who's the one who did say it? Oh, Rizal. Yeah, Rizal. 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 And it was time for the world to begin to understand how all these things work. Before then, it was a big Hester. You see, it was a big Hester. And, there was, uh, that, and the Rambam, and many of you showed him that they, they did not know about Gigur. The Rambam says that the, he thought there's nothing to shade him. The Rambam doesn't know who shade him. He died, the Gemara says. Yeah. What? Right. So the Rambam is marked in different ways. There's many Machlik, the Rambam doesn't know from all these supernatural stuff. Because, you know, what, what does this mean? To a rationalist, to a person with, in, in, in that way. You see, it was nothing within the context of two that he knew that could explain that kind of thing, really. You see. And that's the thing. I think, yeah, I don't think I had types of shade in one of his stories. But there are many things which are machinistic and so on. But that's, the, you know, that's essentially the point. But we are in, essentially influenced from the Kabbalah Tari, who established the whole thing from that time. There was a school of Rishon, but it wasn't known. Yeah, but there was a public school. No, essentially what the Ari was... Publicly, after the Ari. The interesting thing about the Ari, the, 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 no, the Ari learned, essentially, the Ari, the Ari learned all his... So apparently what happened was that the Ari learned all, a great deal of his Kabbalah from Eliyahu Navi, from Jilil Yoho. He was taught the thing and he was Megalodus, and so on. It, 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 it was his life was Alfie Dibber, when he went to Tzfaz with as it were, from other, he was told to go to Tzfaz. He was, he was learning in, pra- in, in seclusion. In Egypt. in Egypt, he was told for the last two years of his life to go to... But the point is, for some reason, all of Kaddishol accepted the Ari. They were ready at that time. They were ready, but they were obviously... They were told to. Put it into their hand. Yeah. 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 But on Kaddish also, but the Ari is the source for, for essentially, for the, the old, many, many concepts. He's the one who's, uh, who's opened up the whole lineage of the, of many things which are closed, which are sussum. Because the we had reached that time. You know, just to, uh, um, in a point, you know, that they, I, I, you know, 
a little ahead, but just to mention this point here, so on, you will find that when, when that many times in the Bria, and I, I'll explain later on why this is, that when there's an ispashtas of a certain thing, if something happens in history with the Goyim, it happens with the Jews. Zeluma Zer. There's certain things. And what generally you do find is the following, that when, there's a, when the Jews take a Eureka, when they go down, the Goyim go up. And if you look at history very carefully, you can many times see these parallel events. And I will explain that later on, why that is like that. But, it's a very interesting thing is that, in the 15th century, or in the 15th century, I really live in the 15th, in the 16th <coughs> century, uh, which is about 1570. But his Chochma wasn't espashed until the 16th century. Until the 17th. No, until the, the, the 17th. Until about 1650, 1640, that, that's when it really became known and so on. And the interesting thing is, the, and that has made the most major influence on Kaisal, the Kabbalist Ari, the whole Chochman was influenced, the Yid guy. When you look at it, you will see also that there was another Ispashis that happened at the same time, which was just as profound to the entire Bria. I don't know if you know what. Yeah. What? The Industrial the Science of Revolution, the Enlightenment is all concurrent. That was in the 70s. You mean Newton? Newton. Yeah. The science as we know it began in the 17th century. Newton. Isaac Newton lived, and that's when Galileo Newton lived at the same time. Slightly ep- Galileo lived <coughs> at the same time as the Ari, and Newton lived the next generation. You see, and that's the exact <coughs> same time when the Bolshevik suddenly opened up what's called the Mayanus Achachma to the Omus Olam. He opened up the Mayanus Achachma to the Eden. It's exactly the similar time. Almost like you know, like almost like the Klipa both got a very heavy headache because the Bolshevik was marble, tremendous Achachma to the Goyim, and it was marble, the genius of the understanding of the Bria to the Eden at the same time. You find that very interesting parallel. There are very important reasons for that, which we'll go into later on, but that's what you find it. In any case, what is a very clear understanding is that all human history, the secret of human history and all human events, lies essentially in the individuals of human history. Human history is made up of people. You see? It's made up of people. That's why every time you have a terrorist organization or revolutionary, it's called the People's Republic. (laughs) Anyway, human history is made up of people. Right? And people are made up of neshamas. So fundamentally, human history is explained on the continuous movement, movement and sojourn of neshamas idor achador, in terms of all the different journeys that they take to reach their tikkun. Okay, so we finished this essential concept of shurish and tola. It's a very important one to know. <coughs> you know also when you learn the chumash, you have to realize these are not the same people as we are. They're different people. You see, later on we'll see this much more precisely, what that means that they were different people. They had a different Yetzirah. They had a different Yetzirah. We cannot begin to understand what their Yetzirah is or what their Yetzirah is. It was a different thing. The Koyachas and the Bria were totally different. There were different points in human history when the world was Nishtana in terms of its nature. Human beings actually change in their nature. For example, you find one case, you find an often case that Chazal says over there that in the Antiquity of the Zodela banished the Yetzirah of Avod the Zorah. <coughs> what does that mean? <coughs> there used to be a Yetzirah of Avod the Zorah. Yeah, there used to be a Yetzirah. Now you have Yetzirahs for other things, but the Yetzirah of Avod the Zorah. There used to be a tremendous desire to be over the Avod the Zorah. And you have to fight the Yetzirah. There was a mighty thing I think Rav Ashi was a real, I think was one once said that was it Menashe? He was like, uh, during the base ministry, he was like ridiculing Menashe because he was over the Avodah Zohar. So Ma- Menashe came to him in a dream and said, you think, you think, you think, if you would have been in my time and you, and you would have had my Zohar, and he said something, you would have been dancing in the streets with that on some, some, some place, tell what thing. I don't remember exactly the more. But the fact he was saying is, don't be so quick to judge me. You see, don't be so fast. You know, Alto Dinis Chavir, Alto Dinis Chavir. Why? Because you don't know what my Yitzhah is like. You don't even have that Yitzhah. You don't, it's not within your experience. You see, it's not that you don't understand. You do, you, you do not experience the nature of my Yitzhah. So it's impossible for you to know what I had to go through. That, that's what he said. And that's the same thing. We do not know the Yitzhah is the Yitzhah of these people who lived at those times. So therefore, how, can we know? Yes, there are ways to know. But we have to build up the system from a different standpoint. 
In a sense, yes, that's a good point. In a sense, also, because they got rid of the Yitzhah for Abu Dazar, they also weakened the Yitzhah. <coughs> to some extent. Well, that's related to why it's happened to the Jews, it happened to the Goyim. Well, I'm saying, because the Yitzhah for Abu Dazar was really a, a, a drive for Yeruchnius on a very powerful degree. And once you lowered the Yitzhah for Abu Dazar, which is Yeruchnius in a perverted sense, they also lowered it in, days, in, a, in the good sense. Even yeah. Do you, think, do you think it's coming back at all now? What's that? Isn't the belief in something? No, no, it's not, not, no, no, it's not. Not the way that it was then. They used to be stones. They used to be stones. Yeah, but that's not called. They didn't be stones. They didn't be stones. They didn't be stones. They didn't be stones. See, the interesting thing is, like, you know, the... It's the whole way we look at the things. Like, we we look at them like retarded apes. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, like it's incredible. It's like, you know, like the mice are there. Look at people today, and I'm sure going to the Well, the same way, but you see, we want to say, like, the mice, they were warm and terach. It's father. You know the old story that, you know, the terach was, a, was a, he used to have a shop full of idols. He used to sell idols. <coughs> and people used to come and buy idols. So Avram was, uh, Avram was, Avinu was furious, he said, so he went ahead and he chopped down all the idols, you know the story, you all know the story, and he put the, hand, you know, the axe in the hand of the biggest idol, so his father came in and says, what happened over here? So the Avon said, the big one over there <laughs> killed all the little ones, so his father said, what are you, crazy? The big one can't move, so he said, ah, so then why do you bow down to him? And you know, either Turk was absolutely retarded, <laughs> you know, it was a crook, but what, you know, what was the what was the, the dialogue between Avram and Terach? Obviously, wasn't a push it. Terach wasn't retarded, and Avram wasn't such a chacham. I mean, it was that you know there was something much deeper there. And yet, to understand this is it, the whole thing itself. When they deemed these idols, they knew that these idols don't do anything. They weren't stupid. What it was is there was a whole other thing is that they understood the relationship <coughs> of material objects. You see, to the spiritual sources in the Shemayim. You see, and what it did, what they understood was the following. <laughs> this is the one of the, the answer to what our word is already, our word is already was like. For example, when they used to dive into the sun, the sun, in that kind of sense, they didn't. They, they, they well, they used to start, not, not the sun. They used to, they used to dive into a certain, uh, uh, to a certain object or a certain animal. They understood that this object itself has no koyach. But it was as they understood, they said, this object symbolizes, you see, a certain koyach or a certain koyach in the Bria. And that koyach <coughs> in the Bria comes from a being who's above that koyach. But what they believed was that God, the Bonisham, delegated his koyach to these agents. And what they did was they were offered the symbolic representation of these shluchim, these agents. That's essentially what they did. The Ramon describes this. And this, of course, is an Issa. Because the Bodhisattva says, I am the one behind it. There are no agents in this video. I'm the one. And they, what they did was they dealt with this. But the connection between the things which they worship had a very tremendous connection to the things, you see, that, uh, that they had, for example. So all of them believed in one superpower. Yes, they all, they all realized that. They want to, but they, they, they were certain to usin they made, they didn't want to, they wanted to be in the agents. They had certain things, they, 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 they For example, I'll give, you, I'll give you an example. I, I just, I just to, uh, we'll give an example since we're uh, talking about this, this kind of thing. So, um, and uh, I, mean, I, 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 I saw this. So. Take the ancient Egyptians. We know from the Torah that the ancient Egyptians were the greatest magicians in the world at that time. They were Mahashvam. Right? They were able to do the first four makas. Now, you know what it is to turn a river into blood? That's not a cheap magician's trick. <laughs> That's an incredible thing. They were able to do it. Yeah, there's no big deal. Moshe threw down his staff and made a snake. And it's a big deal. John, they threw down and also became a snake. I ask you, who in this world can make, take a stick, a staff, and turn it into a cobra? or a snake, whatever it was. Do you ever meet anyone that could do that? A real cobra? <laughs> I've never. Now obviously in order to do that, they obviously knew something. They knew something that we don't know anymore. What do they know? They knew obviously the Kirchat Atumah that comes from Kishuv, and obviously they had to know a tremendous amount about Ruchni to understand how these things happen. 
Now, these people who understood all thought, we also know that these people believed in certain things. They have certain le- <coughs> legends. They believed that the Nile was God. You see. Amun Ra, they believed that the sun was God. And they believed, for example, that the cow, you know, the, 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 the many different am- animals, the cat, Vasta, many, many things, and gods, and, and, and they were God, the vulture, many different things they believed were different kinds of gods. Then they have these strange mites. If you ever look at the Egyptian religion, the Egyptian religion is a really, I mean, it's a really strange religion. They have a story there with, where, where, how did the whole thing start? Am- Amun, it's, amazing, it's an incredible thing, what it was, that uh, Amun Ra, I forget the, the story there, that one god was jealous on the other god. Uh, who was he jealous of? <laughs> Thor. I, I forget which one it was. I, I, so he killed, one god became very popular with the people. So this other god got real jealous. So he went ahead and he killed him and he cut him off to pieces. You see. <coughs> Osiris way too from the dead. I forget. So what was the physical representation? Well, I don't want. So what, to this is the Egyptian. So what happened was, well, the guy ca- killed his, 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 his. He killed his, his brother God and chopped him off to pieces. So this brother's wife came along, uh, some of that Osiris, and raised him from the dead. Raised him, put him together, and then he went ahead and he killed the old God or something like that. Uh, it sounds like a real, you know, a really strange <laughs> kind of tale. Yeah. Now, I ask you this question. If you study Egyptian mythology, Egyptian religion, you see these tales. You see, that they believed in it. Did they believe in it? I went, last year I was in Egypt. And I went into the, the areas where they had it. I went into the, I, I saw the, the different pyramids and I saw the different temples that they have in Tom Tom. They have built staggering monuments to this religion. Staggering monuments. <coughs> Monuments that took 3,000 people years and years to make symbols and idols and all kinds of stuff on, on the legends that they, that they believed in. Now, I asked this the question, and I, it's an amazing thing. The people who built this were obviously an amazing, there's amazing people that built these things. I mean, if you ever, the, what, what, the Temple of Karnak, a lot of these places were inc- the most staggering thing that, that, that in these things, uh, in, uh, <coughs> where, I, where I traveled to was, uh, I, it, was Egypt itself is the capital of Egypt is Cairo but but what it is is that this is the Nile and Cairo is over here and this this is the uh, delta of the Nile it goes out in the delta okay <coughs> now what it is is that this is the the city over here Cairo is next to the city the old city which is Memphis that used to be the capital of Egypt in the time of Avomavino, before Avomavino, when Avomavino appeared on the scene, Egypt was an old country, about a thousand years old. <laughs> when Avom showed up, you see, all the pyramids were built long before Avom. The, py- the pyramids were ancient history to Avom. Imagine how far back they are. After Avom, in the time of Joseph and Moshe Benu, the capital of Egypt was called Thebes, which is today called Luxor. Before it was Memphis, isn't it? Well, Memphis is, yeah, Cairo is, uh, Memphis is the old city. The city, the main city, which is down the Nile, about a couple of hundred miles, about four hundred miles, is called Luxor. This is where the Valley of the Kings are, where all the great pharaohs are buried, the one Tutankhamun was buried. And there's a thing on this side of the river, on this side of the river are all the temples, and on this side of the river are all the graves. That's because the sun rises in the east and goes to the west, and the sun is the sign of the living. So the east bank was the union of the living, and they had their temples on the east bank. The West Bank is where the sun set. So here's where we had all the Kvorim, all the cities of the dead were on the west side. <coughs> on this side, they built the Temple of Karnak, which by the time of Yosef was already up. These temples, and when Moshe was around in Thebes, which where he was, this, there's these structures at that time. Now, the Temple of Karnak is a very a structure. What it is, it's about a mile long. It's a mile long. And I'll just give you an example. And there's one, you, you, you get, there's one wall there. It's called the hyperstyle hall. What is the wall? Imagine a stone column. Okay? A stone column. I don't know. Let's say uh, three feet in diameter. Rising 40 to <coughs> 50 feet up in the air. A perfect cylinder. <coughs> okay? Beautifully engraved with hieroglyphics going up. About 50 feet in the air. That's the equivalent of about what? Three stories? And imagine 127 of these lined up. 
They built this without machines. You gotta stand there to see this. It's like staggering. When you see it, it's called the hypostyle, it's a wall. And when you stand there, it's unbelievable. Now, we, they built all this, they, they were over to build all this. Why? Why would these people put so much cost into this kind of work? You see, were they totally mishigar? They would have spent a thousand, and the Egyptians, ancient Egypt had 80,000 Egyptians on government payroll building this stuff every day. That's who built it. There were 80,000 people on, the, on civil service payroll to build this stuff. <laughs> For a thousand years. That's how all this stuff got built. Why would they do this? Because they wanted to worship this? But yet, if you look at these people and you look at what they were over, you see that they have tremendous chokhmah. So you realize that there's something wrong here. There is some, something doesn't wrong. We tend to look at these people like they were ancient baboons. That's how it is. You know, there's stupid people who have nothing better to do than pile stones on top of each other. You see. But that's not true. Because they knew the Chokhmah of Kishim. They understood the mechanism of the Bria in many ways. They're able to fight in Moshe Rabbeinu. It wasn't so posh. Moshe had a hard time with them. And so on. Obviously, what happened was they basically, all the stuff that they have, and it's a fascinating study itself. I want, a long time I want to study it, but I can't, I can't do that now. I don't. But it is a fascinating thing in the Egyptian religion to study the religion and from, if you understand how to do it, you can go back and you can actually begin to figure out what the Inyanam are, probably, of the Kishiv and all the Kirk they used to have. Because obviously it's there, but there, Hobohotaya. In the Egyptian religion and in their monuments is the key to their Kirk. And it's the key to their Habon of the Bria, which is obviously very substantial. That Chokhm is lost. So all we see now is a bunch of stones piled high. You see, all we see is these funny looking, funny stories that we read about what they believe in. But these are not funny stories and these people weren't stupid. These stories were symbolic of some kind of understanding of things that happened that went on. What they are, we don't know. All we see are the relics of what they had. It once was an immense and extremely powerful civilization. I'm just saying this as an aside. To realize that what we think is Avodah Zohar is a very, very far cry of what it is. And why is it? Why is it that these people have such koichas? They have such chokhmah? <coughs> because they were shoshim. That's why. The ancient Egyptians weren't just a bunch of stupid people that just didn't know what to do when they lived in little mud hovels and so on. These people were made <coughs> shoshim, which means that they're incredible nishamas. And they had tremendous koichas and nefesh. Torah looks exactly the opposite. And the Gemara says, "Das Torah, the Hepuch Das Balabai." Das Balabai is Hepuch Das Torah. The secular world would have us believe that the ancient world, you see, were very, you know, very unintelligent, backward, primitive people. But the Torah says, "Vaket." It's these people that were more in touch with the Panini of the Bria than we are. We are no longer in touch with it. They were in touch with it. <coughs> That's what it means to have a Yetzer of our desire to be in touch with the Pneumus of the Bria, except that they got in touch with the wrong part. Well, you well, see. What was the Yetar to decentralize it? To, to that, that, that has to do with the nature of the Sutton. What they would, there were certain things that they would gain. But you see, there's the thing is, there's the motive to decentralize, like you're saying, you see, and then there's the actual decentralization process itself. The motive to decentralize was to take sovereignty away from the Banish Shalom. That's what it is. To say there is not one God, or there's no one person, one being who's in control of it all, there are many beings and so on. And by taking away this kind of sovereignty, it says, it increases the sovereignty of a person. Because you can manipulate. Once you say, you're not the God anymore, you're not the chief God, but these kirchas are all around, then what you're saying is, I can control and determine where these kirchas are. I now rank with you up there, in determining which God I will worship, and how I will worship that. You see, the motive for decentralization was to remove the sovereignty of the Banishal. And they have to remove the necessity for submission to that sovereignty in that way. You see. You could up with some of them? You could up with the ones that you wanted. But they're just agents. They were just agents. How could... Because they, they believed that the Banishal withdrew from the Bria and personified all the Kirkus and these agents and they, and they could relate to these agents. Women, they believed in it. They wanted to believe in that. You see. They want, uh, their motive was, because once it's decentralized, then, everyone out, every man for himself here. 
You see, however, the mechanism of decentralization was based on an understanding of the Kirchus of the Bria. You see what I'm saying? It wasn't just a stupid decentralization that made no sense. They understood how to decentralize it in such a way which was consistent with their Kishuv. You see, obviously their religion is consistent with their Kishuv. You see, which is the ability to, to turn over Teva. So the decentralized process, which essentially is what our Bode Zohar is, contains the keys and the understanding, and it's, it's a contrast in parallel. You see, the Pneumius or the Kirchus of the Bria itself. You see what I'm saying? It was far more sophisticated than we give them credit. You want to say before I ask about the game here that even the Mitzvah had knowledge. A tradition of the of the uh, Supreme Court. Yeah, but they, 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 they had that from Shem. They had it from Shem. They had that from It wasn't that they didn't know about these things, but that they were they were over. They they were that was they 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 were show him. They were show him. Okay, one more thing. One more thing we spoke about. The, bris, the Abom Avinu and the Brisbane Absor. <coughs> Some of the people heard this, I think. We have uh, a, a question before we go on to have a question as well. You want to do it? Well, the union of uh, Yerida and Aliyah that you were talking about, yeah. does that come yeah. from uh, Esau and Yaakov? Yes, yes. Well, we'll get to that. It starts from there. It connects, but it was even before that. We'll get into that. Before that, we'll get into that, yeah. It kind of shows that uh, Muna and knowledge are really very separate. Right? Yes. Because they knew a lot more than we do, and yet they were, you know, in this way, much more yes. primitive. Yes, right. The, right. the possession of knowledge is no guarantee for good behavior. I mean, the moon, yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. They are. They're yes. much more advanced today than, uh, you know. We, we know more. We, know, we are advanced in Protum, in details. They were advanced in Clorum. They knew the undercurrents of the Bria. We, we know the overcurrents. But technologically, else. We are advanced. But they didn't need our there, technology. You know, they had their kitchen. You know, there's a difference between the Avodah and the Minas. You know what I mean? Yeah, they made a play the world. No science can change a stick to a, to a snake. Well, yeah, you can change a stick to a snake. You can have your science, you know? The difference between the Avodah and the Minas, the Avodah and the Zara, the, 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 there is a subscription, a higher cultus. Yes, that's right. right. There's a difference between Minas and Avodah Zara. With, with, with Minas is the denial of any sovereignty right. or any... Ain't all built by thee. That's a good distinction between... Yeah. Yeah. Why do you need the advanced uh, analysis from Galileo or Newton as a reader for the guy? Uh, no, no, no. I didn't say it was you, reader. Oh, oh, I said before was. Oh, yes, uh, yes. It, 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 in a sense, in a sense, it is you, reader, in a certain way, because of what it, what it means. It's well, it's, it's, it's not. It's not it, the more he has yeah, I, I preface that, but I do this. this the, the progression of science was not a reader, really, in that sense. Although I, what I did say, uh, yeah. I did say that many times when you see or you read it by one, you will see an Aliyah by the other. Here, here, here you don't find it. Here you simply see a parallel. Right. became an illusion of a snake? They had a snake, which they made an illusion of a snake. Okay. <laughs> what about the, not, the, the, the denial with the blood? of the memory of ancient Egypt as against all other ancient lands. Why? Is there any way we can understand this? I mean, no one would even observe that kind of a fact, basically. But the fact did stand out. Okay. We know from Ashkafa that when Christ saw those Averis, Chatoim, there's Kitugim. And what happens is when there's Kitugim, Christ loses their Ruchnis. 
all the great koichas that should come from this ruchnis is lost. Where does it go? It, where does it go? It goes to the goyim. That's where it goes. It goes to the umas That's where it goes. And what happens is it goes from one nation to another. Now what happens is when Kali Yisrael does certain averis, it goes to a certain nation. Now Kali Yisrael can get those that koyach back. Because what happens is when it loses, when Kali Yisrael, when the Yidin lose that koyach, that koyach goes to a certain nation and suddenly that nation becomes very great. It rises in power and in a in the world. And then Kali Yisrael becomes, goes into that nation and becomes, submits to that in a form of uh, persecution. And when Kali Yisrael is persecuted by that nation, what happens is they take back all the koyach that they lost. The Yisurin, <coughs> the Kali Yisrael, is soivro at the hands of that nation takes the koyach back. That's a basic idea. We'll elaborate on that concept later on. It's a very important concept. You see? Okay. Now what we basically know, and the Vrindagon says, is that the, in Daniel it says here that there will be Dalit Shibudim. You know, it's that Kalish will experience this loss and retrieval four times with four different Umas. And Daniel says there are four Umas. Uh, uh, what is it? Egypt, Mitzrayim. No, Mitzrayim was first. Persia, Paras, Bovo, Yav, or Greece. I forget. For, for Bovo, plus Mordain, then uh, Yavon. Yavon, and then Rome. Edom. Edom. So, is it Mamrach on the Medrash and by Artai, so Rome, Chesha, and Chesha? Now, the last, the last one is Edom. Edom is Esau. Now, who is Esau? Basically, Edom is essentially Christianity. All the nations that submit to Christianity is Edom. That's really what it is in Psalm. So, the fact that the Jews have been under the persecution of the Christians for so many years, essentially, is what's been going on in that way. Now, the Vilnagon says a very interesting thing. The Vilnagon says that towards the door of Mashiach, as we approach it, Edom will lose its supremacy as the central persecutor of Kalisol. That's what the Vilnagon says. Who will take up the supremacy? So the Vilnagon says this, and he left. knows it. Who's left? Who well, the Vilnagon says the following. The one who will take up that supremacy right before the Zavana Mashiach and persecute Kalisarol, because they have the Koyach and they have the Urus, is the Erevav. Now, what do you mean the Erevav? The Erevav, <coughs> in Kalisarol, <coughs> the Erevav were those people who were Magaya and Yutis Mitzrayim. When Yutis Mitzrayim, the Erevav, were those people, Goyim, they were Egyptians, who went out and were Magaya, along with the Jews, and accepted Mount Torah. They were the one Goyish nation which said, we do. They accepted the Torah. And by accepting the Torah, they went out, you see, and they became Jews. But the Chet of the Eagle, which they were basically responsible for, lowered them. So that the Erevav were no longer like regular Jews. The Koyach of the Klippa was much more powerful with the Erevav than it is with the Jew. It is. You see, the egg, the Chet Egel, because they were the ones that said, ah, what's going on over here? Moshe is dead. I don't want to go to the Chet Egel. Moshe is dead and so on. We're going to be lost in the dead. Let us all go back to Egypt. You ever notice the authors? Let us go back into Egypt. You know? Was there, was there, was there, was there an insufficiency of graves? You know? How many people you know, but the Mitzrayim that you brought us over here? This was always the air valve. They always wanted to go back because that's where their home was. They were Egyptians. That's why they're always tiny. Let's go back. By the Chet of the Eagle, what happened was, they saw this thing, they fell, and they said, let's go back, let's make an ego. The way that the Jews themselves didn't really want this, but they were mashpia on that kind of thing. So they all made it, they were all punished. However, since the Erevav were essentially the ones who were responsible for the ego, they, therefore, were in the ghetto of a Chota and a Machta, whereas Christ were only in the ghetto of a Chota. Does everyone understand that? All, no, what, all the Jews... The Jews did not come up with the idea of the Egel, right? They just simply missed them. So th- when, they, when they fell with the idea, they were Chotem, they were sinners. But the Erevav not only sinned, but they also influenced the Jews, so they were also Machte. They caused other people to sin. That's like Chava. When other Mishim failed, he only failed as a Chotem. But Chava failed as a Chotem and as a Machte. Because she, she uh, what do you call it, made other for, which is a much worse category. And that's one reason why the category of woman is somewhat different. But in any case, the Erevah were very different. The Erevah thought was stronger in the Chaita Machta? Yes. Now what it is, is therefore the following. Since the mice of the Erevah is a Chaita Machta, the clip of the Erevah is a Chaita Machta. That means that in order for the Erevah to deal with the Yetzirah, the Yetzirah says not only to do a sin, but to get the next Jew to do the sin too. 
that's the that's the Yitzhah of an Eva. The Yitzhah of, of, of a Yid who's not a, who comes from Avon Yitzchak and Yaakov simply says, "Go do a sin." There's no time to get some other guy with you. You know what I mean? The time to go, to go, the one who has the time, the Yid who has the time to do it. So I'm not saying, oh, I have to I'm not saying who's the Eva. I'm not. Generally, it comes from the Eva because that's his clip, that's his Yitzhah. Okay. This is the distinction. So what happened was, since they have this Yitzhah and so on, <coughs> they are much lower than Yidin. And what happens is, throughout history, the Yidin go from nation to nation and pull back. They retrieve the lost Ruchnias by suffering at the hands of each guy. Finally, when they go to the last one by Adam, they pull back the Kurdish of Edom, there's one more na- nation they have to suffer. Why? Because they pull back most of their Oris already. Most of the Kurdish that they have is already pulled back. The last Kurdish, so therefore, but when they still sin, the last of these Kurdish, since they're the smallest things, you see, don't go to the Goyim. Except that they go to other Jews who are lower, and that's the Erev Rav. The Erev Rav, you see, the different Goyim differ in terms of, um, I don't know, I may be bringing too many concepts here. I think I am. Am I bringing in too many concepts? Finish up, though, Let me finish. Oh, whoever understands this will understand this. Not, you will all understand this when I finish this. In two weeks, you will all understand this. And maybe I'll go over it again. You understand it very clearly. But what essentially what it is, oh, is that the air valve constitutes the, la- the simplest and least receptacle for the koyach of these things. Because they are Jews themselves. The air valve or the Jews who live today that are descended from the air valve are Jews. And therefore, what it is, is they are lower Jews than the other Jews who come from Avram. But since they are on a lower level, they become the receptacle of the koyach of Kalisor when they do Khatoim. So therefore, Kalisor has to go under the Chet. They have to go under the persecution of the Erevav. Now, how could Kalisor go under the persecution of the Erevav? And I tell you very simple. When you look around in the world today, right? Who's giving the Jews all the toss? The Goyim? No. Not really. You don't find the Jews are free in most countries, except for Russia. We still have, the Russia is still in the Koyach of Edom. But most Jews are not. The Jews in America are free. The Jews in Israel are free. The Jews in South America, all the places in Europe, they're all free, basically. Right? Where do they get their, where do they get their persecution? You know where they get it? They get it from the following. The Jews in America are persecuted and destroyed, not by the Goyim, but by the Jews. The Reform, the Conservative, all these guys have wiped out Jewry. How many old fact Jews are? Most Jews, unfortunately, one third of all Jews in America are reformed, one third are conservative, and one third, and, and almost the next third, we call it, uh, all, don't belong to anything. Who did this to the American Jews? Who wiped out American Jewry? Reformed the conservative, basically. In Israel, why are most Jews fly? They're not from. Who wiped them out? The Zionists. The Zionists and the whole, all, all, the, all the people from there on the Labour Party and so on, who she was to destroy Yidin. You see, these Jews, so therefore the Yidin Orthodox Jews suffer. Pura, Ruchni is, is suffering. Why? Because the guy says you can't put on Tfilin? No. Because there's another Jew up, who goes up in the pulpit and says, Mutalach, forget about Tfilin. That's why most, the reason why there's no Ruchni in the world is not because a guy prevents it. It's because the Yid has convinced you not to do it. That's why most people are fried. You understand my point? Who are these people? Who is this clipper that attempts to destroy the last witness of Israel? The other Jews. Why? Because they come from the air of love. That's what it means. That's what the Vilagom who said 200 years ago saw this. And that's the symbol that was right before the Mashiach. That the actual persecution, the ones who are responsible for the spirit of destruction of Christ of today are no longer Goyim. They are other Jews. They are Jews who are Choyche or Machte Do you understand what I'm saying? That's what it means that one of the Koyach the Erev Rav. Now, when did the Erev Rav start, really? When did this Koyach of other Jews start? When did the beginning of the Reform Movement start? Who knows? What? Nechsam Seif, you know when Nechsam Seif lived? About 1830, 1820, no, actually lived in 1780, 1790 and so on. There's one, Ahaskola started then. Moshe Mendelssohn, when he planted the Torah, the reform, that all started in about 1770, 1780. That's when it started. That's when the Kerech of the Erevah became the Spashem. In 1770, around that time, at the end of the 18th century, the Erevah became the main persecutor of Kaisal. The main clipper of Kaisal, which from them, Kaiser will have to be persecuted to take back the last of their kochas, you see. And that started at the end of the 1700s, you see. 
What else started at the end of the 1700s? What else started? So I'll tell you what started in the What started at the end of the 1700s was what? Don't see, that's the revolution. No, that was much. That was in later in the, the mid mid 1800s, 1840. That started. But I'll tell you something else that started. Who? who? No, that was in the 1500s. What I just talked about before. Egyptology. What? Egyptology. Egyptology started in 1770. Now, what does Egypt? What does Egyptology have to do with Eivov? The answer is, it's the same klipa. It's the same klipa because the koyach of the Eivov comes from ancient Egypt. So, just when the time when the Yidden, who were at the koyach, suddenly became higher, they became elevated in terms of their koyach over other Jews to be choyta machta. Their ancient shvoshim also suddenly elevated. But the ancient church is dead. All the ancient Egyptians are no longer here. But the memory, the zeicha of ancient Egypt suddenly became alive. You see, it's almost like it was rekindled. You see what I'm saying? So the two is exactly the same time. You see, this was a thought that occurred to me. I don't know, I'm my mule into the valley of the king. But what was the experience? What was, was the experience was the fact that when I was there, see, but they told us about God. That Koyach still exists 2,000 years later on the people who want to be Choyta Machta. But it's not ancient Egypt anymore. But it's the Zecha or the memory of ancient Egypt that suddenly became alive. You know, when this became alive. It's a very strange. Right. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> you know what, Georgie? It shows you. It's fighting in a certain sense. I don't know if you realize. But would you see, would you see the, if you understand what I've said, then I think to a certain extent you have. I mean, the, more, the technical details about the clip, so we'll, we'll get into that some other time. But the amazing thing is you see an interesting thing that no event that occurs in, in, in history is unaccounted for or meaningless. That something, some Frenchman, some guy found a stone. A stone, what, what the, you find a stone? People find stones every day. And some other Frenchman came along and said, wait a minute, I know what the stone means. And he tried it out of Somehow it's connected in Germany to Mosin Mendes and starting the Ascola and the Reform. Like the two, like it's the same, you know what? You know, it, it, it's, it's like these strange parallels that go on history, thousands of miles apart. That, you know, what does one have to do with the other? And yet, the Urus that bring one for this, for that, is like an internal connection. So that there's not one event that happens in the Bria, which in some way is not connected to the ultimate, you know, to everything else, but it's connected to the ultimate Tikkun of Tadisrael in that way. And the Tikkun of, of the Bria. I, I mean, if you catch what I'm saying, it's a very... It's a very, uh, I, I was like, you know, like, you know, because it's, it's not, it's a very powerful thing. You see, see the Hashkocha. I, I felt that for that second, the, a, a veil of, the, of, a, of, of a hidden thing was suddenly open. I just like, some, saw it, and I, I, I feel it's, it's a hundred emers. Wait, yeah. So the light of what you're saying, the Holocaust, yes. which is the most profound incident oh. in our time, it's a very high event. Yes. Oh, now you, I didn't want to go into it. To write, yes. Essentially, to be very, to be, to make, to oversimplify an incredibly horrible experience. When the Germans got finished with the Jews, right, Amalek was impoverished of their curse. And what happened right after World War Two? Exactly. Because there was no more kitchen. Something ran up and says, "Wait a minute! How could you start this? How can you? How, where did they come to be zeichet there as well?" So the bunch of turned around and says, "Why not?" So the eight says, "What do you mean? Because I have all the kolchus. I have all the kolchus more than So the bunch of said, "Look again." And then he turned around and looked in his big bin, and it was empty. That was the dialogue that went on. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> you have to that later. That's, it's much more deeper than that. It's more profound. But that is the mechanism. The mechanism. Every time a Jew dies at the hand of a guy, he takes back that koyach that he lost because of his chatoim. So where does that koyach um, express itself? I mean, are you saying that... Which koyach? Where? Well, I mean, you're saying all the, that, that they were calling back all the horrors, right? Where are they? Why, but why are you saying that Jews now, today, after the Holocaust, should be much greater than? Yes, we will. What's going the, on? The, 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 you mean what? <laughs> what are you talking about? What about all these yeshivas in, in, in Europe that have been destroyed, and we don't have any of that now? I mean, yes, uh, no, no. A lot of people kind of now. No, that's not, no, no, because that he. I can't. No, no. There's no question. The, the Germans, Hitler was successful in one way. 
It was his desire. <laughs> well, why? Time, the reason time. How many? Why can't you compare ye? What are you talking about? Ravon Cutler said, Ravon said, Ravon said that from the time of World War II to now was the equivalent spiritual loss of 400 years. 500. 500 years. That's how much we lost. When Europe was wiped out to what America was, it's like equivalent of 500 years of gradual deterioration. That's what it is. Not true. What you're saying is very true. But that is the mystery. And I'm not going to be mouthed with it in a total way, but that's the Hanukkah Sayyichot. Because the truth of the matter is, look at the following. Okay? Actually, I've already deviated so much from the thing. <laughs> but uh, let me the following, and I'll give you an understanding exactly this point. The Torah says, V'it Achishena. I will bring the Moshe Mashiach, V'it Achishena. In its time, I will quicken it. V'it in its time, Achishena. I will hasten it. So the Gemara says, the Gemara says the following. What does that mean? How, even if it comes in its time, or you will hasten it because of the schism of Kali Israel. Right? How can you have both? So the Gemara learns out the following. That the Moshe Mashiach, or the, the whole thing can materialize in one of two ways. Either it can materialize by the schism of Kali Israel, because through the Chira, the Tzadikim, right? That is the mode called Achishena. Because Kulam Zakoim. Or else, it will materialize in a different way, Be'ita, in its time. What does that mean, it's materialized in its time? What it means is that there is a certain time that Yemosh Mashiach must start. <coughs> you cannot go beyond that point. That point is referred to as the case, or the end. That's called the case. Nobody knows when that hour is. That is a fixed hour. And that hour says that beyond the second, there cannot be any gula. How do we know there's such a concept? Because when the Bodhisattva said to Moshe, he said, you know, you have to bake matzahs because there's not enough time. You gotta be out quickly. You gotta be out by choice. So you can ask the question. We've been sitting here for 200 years. Why all of a sudden you're mocked within a couple of hours? You know? The answer is because that once the second after choice was already part of Gula. And you are no longer to be in that spot. That's the meaning of the case. Once it comes, it's there, it must be. Like the Gemara says, the malucha or the sovereignty of one king does not overbound the sovereignty of another king by one second. Each melech has the exact amount of time in which he be a melech. He cannot usurp one second of the melucha that belongs to another king. That's even the case. Once it's here, that's it. Now, how do you reach the case? The case is not reached <coughs> by the schism of Kalizor. Right? If Kalizor are tzaddikim, right? If Kalizor are tzaddikim, who is what's called schus, right? Then they bring on the concept of Achishena. Right? But if Kali Yisrael are Chayogu, right? Then the only way they can be Nigal is Be'ita, right? Right? Which essentially is the case. You understand these two Drachum? Okay? Now, this Drach we understand. As soon as Kali Yisrael is uh, Tadikim, you'll get the Achishena. Right? Both of these Right? Constitutes the Mois of Mashiach, which is the Gula Asida. Okay? One of these two paths must be traversed. Now, the question is this. What does it mean to divert, traverse this path there? What does that mean? They cannot come beyond a certain point when this doesn't happen. But how can it happen? How can it happen? If they're not Sadiqim, how is it happening? It's happening by the way I just described. What the Bonishim says. Either you get your Kirkus because of Sadiqim, or you pull back your kirchus to your surah. That's what happens. That's how the case is established. If you don't pull back the oris, the kirchus that you have, and the schusim, you know, in order to be mazachich, your gufu, and tchiyas amazing, this whole thing, don't, because of your tzadikim, you'll pull it back. But you're going to be pull it back in a totally different way. And we're going to have to pull it back from where it is, to your surah. It has to be pulled back. It's, it's got to be pulled back. Has to be pulled. Yes, it's got to be pulled back. Now, we find a very interesting concept, which is what, what you're saying. Hold on one second. What's going on over there? <coughs> what is this thing of the case? We know, you see, that the case will come when everyone is chayyab, when the entire world is filled with Rishoyim. Because the Gemara says, the Ein Ben David Boy, Mashiach will come, right? When either Kali or all Tadikim, or Kali or all Rishoyim. That's an incredible concept. What does that mean? It means this. If the all Tadikim, he comes on his chos. If they're always showing him, then it comes Ali the case, because there's no schusim. Now the question is, how can the Mashiach come Ali the Old Shoyim? 
That's the kind of. So the thing we say to you is the following. That's clear thing. We know this. That what happens is that right before the case, if that's the way it's going to happen, and that's the way it looks like it's happening, right? There's something called the Ikvas of Mashiach. The generation right before the Mashiach is called the Ikvas of Mashiach. The he of the Mashiach. <laughs> that's the generation right before. Now, if the Mashiach is coming by the case, it means that the generation right before him is the worst generation you've ever seen. That's what it means, right? The question is, how can one generation before be the worst thing you've ever seen, and the next generation, everyone is there with Mashiach, everyone is in the Vim. Like in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu. That's staggering. Every Yid would be a Novi in the time of the Moshe Mashiach. Do you know that? Navu would be the Jews, right? Navu would be the Jews, like, uh, like fish, are, like water is the fish. That's what it is. Every Jew will be in the Snabe, automatically. They'll be able to know the future and they'll know all kinds of incredible Chokmas from the Vias, which is the highest Madeg we talked about last week, automatically. That's the stature of the Emerson Mashiach. So the question is, I can understand if all Khalis are Tzadikim. So I can understand the Tzadikim, so they're going up, 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 up by the stuff. Suddenly the Mashiach comes and miss them another level like this, right? But if it's through the gates, they're going down, 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 all that this way, and suddenly Mashiach comes and lifts them from the bottom all the way up. Like, what is that? What kind of mechanism is that? That's what you're saying to me in a more sophisticated form. That's what then you're saying. What are you talking about? How can we do such a thing where you have the state of Israel and, you know, all the, we took back all these earners from the Goyim, we got the state of Israel, we're starting the Guru process, and it's getting worse and worse. You see? That's what you're asking me. And that, what you're asking me is, what is the rationale behind this scheme? This there. So I say to you the following. It appears to be worse and worse. And that is the flaw. It's really not worse and worse. Because the truth of the matter is, you can't have an Indian of Mashiach coming suddenly with a, with a whole... With, with, where the Tikkunum is not established, where the Urus are not back to Kaisal. By definition, the Urus have to be back to Kaisal before the Mosh Mashiach can start. So the question is, what you see, therefore, is that the Urus are back to Kaisal. Kaisal has its Kurkhas, even though everyone is Rishoyim. How is that possible? How is that possible? You explained it once. You said that they did everything else. It's just very, very few small things that have to be done. Because the truth of the matter is, what? Well, first of all, these <coughs> are greater. But there's another fact also. It's only a pe- it's a, These people are not real Rishoyim. They are only apparent Rishoyim. You see? Because most people who do Chatoyim today don't do Chatoyim. Because they really want to do Chatoyim. They don't know anything. The Chazanish said that today there is no more, a re- there's no such thing as an Apicorus anymore. You can't, you will not be able to find a Min. Because a Min is a real sophisticated creature. He's a man who sits there and thinks and says, you know, I don't want to believe in this stuff. I don't want to do this stuff. Leave me alone. You know, nobody sits down and thinks over here today about, I don't want to do this stuff and so on. Everyone has so many headaches and so many sores. He doesn't do it because he doesn't have, you know, he's too far Newman to be suing with sores and divers, you know. That's why he's involved in Chatoim. Everyone, everyone continuously slips into a chet. You don't see people walking in and marching in there like he wants to move in. You know, there's no march into a chet. You know, you don't find people like that anymore. Most of the Jews today were not full march because they don't know anything. You see, they were brought up in a generation in the teenage Shanishba. The equivalent to infants who are brought up among the Goyim from, from an infant. They don't know anything anymore. All the Jeet and Israel, right? They don't the despise them. All these people, they're not, they don't know anything really. They were destroyed by their air valve, so they don't know the total Amoratsum. The reason why most Jeet are not from is not because they were Shoyim, it's because they're Amoratsum. That's why. So if they're Amoratsum, they obviously really don't have Bechira. Really. Except on maybe a couple of spots that they do know. If they don't have Bechira, they cannot be Rishoyim. And if they cannot be Rishoyim, they cannot lose Eris. Eris only leave, you see, through a Kitrug. But the Sutton can't come up and say, Aha! I'm taking what you have, you see. Remember, it's Dabkas Bavah. Only if the man says, I'm giving you what I have. And the man gives it, if he does a Chet, Adi Dei Bechira. But if he doesn't do a Chet, Adi Dei Bechira, he does a Chet because he doesn't know any better, or he slips into it, or something like that, then the Yitzhah has got a Shavach Taina. He really can't do such a great job. His Kittuk is very weak. The Yitzhah up there is a very bad job. It's very poor times for the Yitzhah up there. 
There is a big recession going on in the Shemayim at this point. You see, it doesn't look like that. It looks like what recession is going on, you know? It looks like, it looks like he's, in, he's having a heyday up there. But the truth of the matter is he's sitting there and just like looking for the last of the koyachas. You know? That's really what it is. That's, that's mamish what's going on. You see, he's losing it all. You see. And that's the thing over there. That's how we're coming to the case. So the Vodisham says, like this. You see, well, he says, he says the following like this. The Vodisham says like this. Either you come to the case in a very well dressed suit, you see, bedecked out and really, you know, you know, you know and, and, and a big day malchus, this nap. <coughs> Or you come to this, or you, if you come to the gula, you see, you come to the party, you see, either you're going to come to the party in, in a very well decked suit and on, or you're going to come to the party in rags. Either way, you're going to come to the party. Either way. <coughs> but the point is, what is critical is to realize that in both cases, you are now zuchah to come to the party. You see, <coughs> that's it. And that's how it works. You see. That's the, what I, that's, that's the, <coughs> the best way I can answer your question right now without going into too much detail. You think that they are, they, we show him out there. You think that this stuff is going on. That's not true. It's not going on. And the biggest lie is the fact that most Jews are not fly. You see. The fact that most Jews today are not from is the biggest liar. You see. Why? How would it be if everyone was a Russian? What would it be like? What? If everyone was mommish we show him, that would be something else. Why? Because if mom, a Russia gives away his Kirchus to the Yitzhar. It means that the Yitzhar will begin to build up his arsenal substantially, you see. How would that look? What? It would look <laughs> like all the, all the Kirchus are on his skin and there's nothing in Kalisor. If all Kalisor has to show him, show him, they could not be a Gula because they have no Oris. What, what would the circumstances in the world look like? I mean, people, what would people be doing? I mean, if they all were showing? Yeah. What, sure. what does it take to be Rishoyim? I mean, the guys, when people sit down, they don't want to be from the Adwa. They want to be Oisik in Rishis. They want, they want to be Oisik in Tinkhwais and Gizel and Geneva and Taiva and Gaiva. They want to be Oisik. That's happening? Hmm? Well, no. Not really, no. No, no. But they want to do it, even though they know what the Emerson is. Even though they know that there's another side very clearly against it. <coughs> Most people don't know there's another side. So they're in it by default. You can't lose Oris by default. Not really. It's not a different thing than once in the early show that uh, the size this fact that, that people are only have to suck in small little thing for the ghoul to come back. So the insights are empty. But this is the hidden method. When it says in the Torah, the Bodhisham says, Ani, the Bodhisham says, Uki bayomahu hasta astes ponai bayomahu, I will hide my face. You know, when Khalisa does not do the Torah, then what, I, I will hide my face. You see, what the Bodhisham is saying is that I will hide my face, not that I will abandon Khalisa, but I will hide my face, it means that the tikkun of the Bria must go in disguise. That's what it means. I will hide my face. It means, you no longer clearly see my koyach, my imprint in the Bria, which is the imprint of Tikkun. You will not see the koyach that toy clearly. You will see it hidden. That, what you're saying is consistent with, with, with the Kafka's statement that uh, you don't even know the, the double has to, Russian Kafka, you don't even know the has to. You don't even know the has to. In previous times, it was has to, like, in time, uh-huh. like, like self, self-called Baba on forum uh-huh. side. Then instead there were has to. It was after Then instead there was, there was Haras Baba and there was has to. The time we live in now is a naive, yeah. naive state, which you, you don't even know Hester has. Yeah. You know, people today, you ask them around the street, is there, is there Hester part of today? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. The, the Emes looks like Shekel and Shekel looks like Emes. Can you, can you explain how you term a cornerback Oros? Who? That's a good point. No, I can't do that now. <laughs> that's how it's done. But I, that's a whole, how it's done is a very, that's a complicated process. But essentially, that's the mechanism which does it. You sue him as Mamaric and it's kind of back over. Some kind of central idea you can express of why that should no. happen? No. In order to understand that, you have to understand something about how the Yitzhah functions. Because I tell you something very interesting. And I don't know if I was ever Mazda this film. I just made a statement. Okay, and this is the interesting thing, and this is the most really, in a certain sense, ah, I'm so out of all. Yeah. Now it's incredible. 
Okay, give me a secret. Well, I will, I will let you with the most, really the most mind-boggling concept of all. It is. But to me, this is the most mind-boggling concept, really, in the whole system. You know, and it's an amazing thing. And I'm not going to go into why this is and so on, but it's the, it's the hidden design element and so on. And I'll tell you very simply, we said since if you do a mitzvah, right, then you bring the ghoul of the tikkun to your mitzvah. You bring the earth to yourself to your mitzvah, right? Right? However, if you don't do it, Right? Then you do go through Yesuin. Right? And Yesuin draws back the earth. Now, let me, there's only two Koyachas in the Bria. There's the Koyach of Toiv and there's the Koyach of Ra. There are no other. There's really only one Koyach, but essentially there's only two forces in the Bria, basically, which exist today. It's called Koyachas of Kedusha and Koyachas of Tumor. Okay? Now, if you even do mitzvahs and so on, they bring the, t- the Tikkun of the Bria to what? To the Koyachas of Kedusha. Now, we just said that the other way is through Yisur and stuff like that. Where does Yisur come from? From Kedusha or from Tumor? Who, who, where does Yisur come from? From the Kedushas of Kedusha or the Kedushas of Tumor? From Tumor. How do you know it comes from Tumor? It comes from the government. But how do you know it's... What? It's not origin, it's ages. Because, because it's Ra. Yisur, it's when you examine Yisur, right? What is Yisur? Is it, a, good, is it ex, a pleasant experience? No, it's an unpleasant experience. Toiv could come with Kedusha. What Kedusha produces is Toiv. Toiv means it's a very pleasant experience. When you experience something very pleasantly, you see, or fundamentally, not all the time, but it's coming from Toiv in a certain sense. But you soon is Ra. It can only be coming from the Sutton himself. So you soon comes from the Sutton. But we ought to say that you soon brings the Gula. Right? So therefore, put the two together. Who is bringing the Gula? Who? I just made a statement of this. The Sutton creates you su- what? Look at this look at this syllogism. The Sutton, right? Right? The Sutton creates, right? The Gula, right? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yesuin, right, contributes to the Gula. Okay? The Sutton creates Yesuin. Hence, what's the conclusion? The syllogism. What's the conclusion? The conclusion is. This. The greatest shaliyah of the Bernshaw in bringing the Gula is the Sutton himself. We just thought that the Sutton is the one who grabs all the curses away. Unwillingly. Unwillingly. And the story of how he does this is the most incredible story of all. You see, you what we're saying is in more dramatic... That has to do with how the people are higher than they're no good. They could be Mekar of the No, I'm not saying no. No, not to Bechira. Then I said that the Chayob, it's not Mishoyim, they're not Mamash Mishoyim. No, at least the Chayot in the sense that they do a Chatoim, but it's only a parent wish. They don't know from a lot of them. This is a scenario then that they... This is a scenario that Han Chagas used with the road. Yes, this is a scenario. But the fundamental thing is to put it more dramatically is the following. That the Rebunisha achieves the ultimate good by absolute evil. That's really what it is. Pure evil creates absolute goodness. Eventually. Not eventually. No. Yes, no, even Why? Each second it does. Through a certain mechanism. Through a certain mechanism. How? And that is the mystery of the entire thing. That is the mystery <laughs> of the Hanogasa Yichud. And that's what Yichud means. You know what Yichud means? Yichud means Einoid Mavadoi. There is no other Koyach in the Bria but the Bonachon. There is no other Watson in the Bria but the Bonachon. What is his rotten? Lehitim. Right? So therefore, even evil must serve the function of Hatava. That's what it means, the Hanogas Hayyichud. Let's check down to the Torah and call Milsa. Gamzul the Torah. That's what it means. But we say Gamzul the Torah. But that's what Gamzul the Torah means in Tznimit. That's what you said that the Gemara said in Brochah, that on every round we'll make a Brochah. Yes. We'll see it. We'll see it. We'll understand. That's what you spoke once about the Hashim. I'm going to put it together. Yeah, but I'll tell you the truth is very 
I've really gone far afield <laughs> in, in a lot of things, and we spoke about a lot of strange things tonight. In day-to-day in, in -day life, a lot of practical things, you see that you know, things are bad. You know, when it gets very bad, that's when things mm -hmm. take a little turn for the better. Some well, sometimes, yeah. Someone is sick, he slept for his whole life, and you know, he's not sick enough to be cured, to, to operate, but he's sick enough to be in incapacitated, and he gets very sick to get out of each. And bottom line, my love is you got to take care of him. Take care of him, and he's better. Yeah. In order to understand these times, it's the most difficult. Because there is no MS that doesn't have Shekha, and there's no Shekha that doesn't contain MS. There were times a long time ago when there was MS purely, and there was and there was Shekha purely. There was only one time in all of creation when there was pure MS and there was pure Shekha. What? Adam was Why? Because Adam was... Separate. Ah, you got it. They were separate. That's what it means. Outside. It was outside. Once he did the Chet, remember? There was the union and there was an Avuvia. We spoke about that? Once there was that Avuvia, then the two were never anymore disconnected. And as more Machatoyim, there's a greater and greater <coughs> Avuvia. When you get the interaction here, there's such an incredible Avuvia that when you look at something which is MS, like it has tremendous shek in it. And you look at something which is shek and it has tremendous MS in it. And that's what it is. That's why, how do you see this? What do you see this? I'll tell you, for example, you find even in Nazi Germany, you find, for example, in Nazi Germany, right? They were killing Jews by the millions in their concentration camps and so on and so forth. Yet, when they would have to do certain things, the Germans, they would have a governmental system. They still had a governmental system. They still had a judicial system, court and so on, right? And of course, there was a fake trial and so on, but so on. Even Russia today, for example, communist Russia, they have a judicial system. They have a whole legal system and so on. Yet, they always show him over there. It's a joke and so on. Why? Why? You know, why put up with the charade? You want to reassure him? Be reassure him. What do you want? Why this fake guy? This charade on Because the answer is you can't do it. That's what it means. It means that a Russia cannot be a pure Russia anymore. He works at it. He really tries. But he can't do it. You know why he can't do it? Because when he becomes a real Russia, he can't, as he becomes more and more Russia, suddenly he begins to find this, this strange intrusion of MS in him. And he can't doesn't understand it. And the MS still shies, even from his wishes. So that's what he has to say. He's got to put a facade on. You yes, see, yes, you know, yes. no Russia can do wishes without some facade of MS. Or else he feels uncomfortable. Why? Because that's the MS in the wishes. You see, that's the MS in the in, in, in the tumor and in the, in, in the thing. And so the the vice versa also. There is no tzaddik that doesn't have things. There's no there's no person who does certain kind of, kind of mitzvahs known without having some kind of shekel in it also. Something like what, what can it do for me? Or you know, where am I going to benefit this and, and so on and so forth. It's the same kind of thing. It's because it, there's a tremendous alvivia. That's how it is thought. So Even Nazi Germany had to do that. I think, by the way, the, 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 the old time Amalek like, was an exception that they were they distilled for themselves pure uh, tax from, the, from their alvivia. It's like a distilled type. Well, that's a good question. Uh, possible. <coughs> the rock, they, they are rather. Rock, rock, all I am. Yeah, now they are, but they are the shy, they weren't that time before. I mean, before. I'm talking about the old time. All no, the old, before the before the uh, the the Rafidim, before the uh, before the, the start with the Jews. Well, that's a different issue. That's the issue of uh, uh, talking about the trans for transformation business. Uh, after, I don't know. After, after, afterwards, let's say afterwards. No, after the Kula Ra, there's no Avivia with them, not at all. There is yeah. a no, no, there after is one. There's an external, there's a superficial Avivia. But that, that's a whole other After the transformation, the transformation. No, no, there isn't. That's the thing. But I want to say a thing. Most people think. You know, what most people think. And this is a funny thing. Most people think that it's much easier to be a Russia than it is to be a Tadek. And I tell you, you're absolutely mistaken. Totally mistaken. You have to know, you don't know how much mysterious nefesh a person has to go through to become a Russia. Because just like the Yetzirah bothers a Tadek, the Yetzirah bothers a Russia. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. And it's, and it's, and it's, and it's, most people don't know that. It's very hard to be a Russia Gama. You should know it takes a Buddha. And it must have avoided to become a Rosh Gama. <laughs> it does. Just like the case that avoided to become a... Why, why did it take an avoided to become a Tzadik Gama? Because you got to get rid of the Yetzirah. You see. But they, but because they are you, but it takes a tremendous avoided to be a Rosh Gama. Because the Rosh has got to get rid of the Yetzirah. You know, again, let me go on to the, uh, <coughs> to the next topic. <laughs> it's not the next topic. It's really a continuation into a much closer depth. And... Uh, our essential goal is again to uh, to understand a lot of the uh, the events which happen in the world. It's a very very difficult thing to understand, and 
what I'd like to attempt to do is, but by the time we finish this, I don't know how long it takes. take. will take a couple more of these shoes. Is to give you the Roshi Prochum to understand many, many of the things that go on today. You will not know them in their details, but you will understand them then. A lot of things about in their clothing. <coughs> We established the concept of uh, last week. We established the concept of the con- of Ovis and Tolis, Shroshim and Tolis. You will recall. We established the whole concept of the neshama in terms of its, the uh, withdrawal of kedusha versus the Kleep and Ra. A lot of these basic concepts. Now, let's begin to put together our di- our, ma- our diagram. <coughs> The central idea which we've established till now is the concept of a Goy or a Ben Olam Hazer versus a Yehudi or an Ivri or Yisrael versus a Ben Olam Haber. That's the central concept which we established. We explained what the difference between the two were and uh, essentially the origins of how mankind became differentiated into these two different kinds of species, spiritual species, and the fundamental process and so on. What uh, I'd like to do now is to go more deeply into the concept of Goy, or the Ven Elam Hazer, in terms of uh, what some of the things, what some of the nature of a Goy is, and a little more closely at the essence here. <coughs> There's a subject uh, in, the, in the secular world, all this, most of the Chokhmas, a great deal of the Chokhmas are divided into several areas you have what's called the arts and sciences you know for those of you who have attended the uh, second institutions colleges and so on there's something called the arts and sciences uh, the sciences themselves generally divide themselves into two different groupings called the natural sciences and called the social sciences the natural sciences are essentially those chokhmas the knowledge disciplines which attempt to understand the phenomena of nature for example physics chemistry, biology. Uh, I, I assume all of you know what these basic chokhmas are. Astronomy, geology, and all the divisions and, and, and inter, and, and inter uh, intertwining disciplines which emerge from them, like physical chemistry, biochemistry, uh, 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 geophysics, I mean, all the co- astrophysics, all the combinations and permutations between the two, all of them. So. But the fundamentally, the natural sciences attempt to understand the world at large in terms of the phenomena which exist in what's called nature, teva. The social sciences attempt to understand mankind. <coughs> the object of study of the social sciences are mankind. And essentially, the social sciences are listed in terms of several different areas. Uh, and this, you're going to see where we're really heading to. Uh, the social sciences, for example, list themselves in the following way. You have economics. psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science. And you have other studies, uh, I think languages and so on, but we're not going to go into these. These are the basic areas of the social sciences. Now, <coughs> essentially, what do these areas attempt to dis- really discover? Well, economics attempts to understand what determines or what causes the economic conditions of the world in terms of, uh, well, I'm going to valuation, uh, goods, trade, money, all these things. Uh, they talk, so the financial condition of a person in terms of how he relates to, to his reality in terms of goods, services, products and in general this kind of financial macro interaction macro. what the? Macro. macro and micro and so on but essentially uh, all those who study economics it, it tends to understand the, the financial motive of mankind psychology it tends to understand the person himself what causes human behavior why does a person act in a certain way and why does someone else act in a different way Sociology is based on a certain premise that the action of people in groups or in societies 
is different than the actions necessarily of an individual. You see, and it tends to understand how society behaves as a whole in terms of different behavior patterns and so on. Anthropology is the study of culture. And essentially what culture is, is that in any given group of people, these people live together, they have a certain way of seeing the world, they have a certain view of the world, and on the basis of this view, they have certain, what's called values, there are certain things that they consider to be important, and things which they consider to be less important, and they have certain kinds of ways of approaching reality. There are different kinds of rituals, there are institutions, for example, marriage uh, is an institution, uh, uh, religion, uh, the, way, the, the religious uh, practices of, 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 of a community, uh, the, uh, the uh, legal practices of a community, all these different things they are essentially are anthropological. They refer to the concept called culture, or how the entire group behaves in the world itself in terms of their entire culture itself. Uh, <coughs> then you have something called political science, and political science is concerned with the, the uh, way mankind governs himself, the notion of the governing bodies, and the exchange and, uh, and interaction, interchange of power, and Which so on. Would be a subset of What's that? Who? Law. Law. No, I, well, not, what, not really. I would think law is more of a subset of, of anthropology and uh, of anthropology in a sense, or of sociology. But political science is more concerned not so much with law itself, the way man regulates his own behavior in a society, but rather with the governing body of society, how mankind governs himself. Now he happens to govern himself on base of law, but political science is concerned with the different kinds of governments, for example, a democracy, an aristocracy, a monarchy, an oligarchy, you know, just the different kinds of governments. And then you have parliamentary governments, constitutional governments, the whole study of governments and international relations essentially comes under political science. Now all of these basically have in common in the sense that they're all aspects of human behavior. They all emerge from the way mankind behaves. Ah. Now, what does all this have to do with us? And what has to do with us is a very, very important, a very profound, very important element. Because I want to tie certain key concepts tonight to understand this, and you'll understand where we're moving towards. The Chachme Hagoyim, or I said, the secular science scientists, attempt to study these subjects scientifically. So they call the social scientists. Now, they, they're not really scientists in the real sense. <clears throat> and any physicist will always look with a certain amount of disdain on a social scientist, like a, a sociologist or an anthropologist. Why? Because it has to do with the nature of the phenomena that they're studying. A physicist studies matter and energy. A sociologist or an anthropologist study human be- studies human beings. Now, what is the difference between studying a human being and let's say studying matter and energy, or even better, let's take a biologist. A biologist study, for example, or let's take a, a human biologist uh, who wants to study human beings. And an anthropologist also studies human beings. What is the difference? Okay, number one. The difference would represent itself in the following ways. Number one, there's a question of the, the object of study. Number one. Okay. And the second thing is the method of study. Now, the object of study in all sciences, whether it's natural or social, is phenomena, the events as they occur in the world. But the natural scientists study natural phenomena and the social scientists study social phenomena. That's a big difference in the object of study. Now, what is the difference in the method of study? Well, it depends a great deal on the object of study. When a biologist studies human beings, if he studies, for example, the nature of certain kind of organs, you see, they want to understand, let's say, this, how the heart does certain things in terms of the lungs and so on. How do they study that? They can study that very exactly and very precisely. Why? Because they can control the events that are taking place. Measure. They can measure. First of all, they precisely. can measure. Precisely. Right. Precisely. They can measure precisely. It's an exact science. The natural sciences are exact sciences. They're precise. They can measure what they're studying, number one, the different properties which exist in phenomena, and then they can see which properties control other properties or interrelate with other properties. You see, how do they do that? Because they can actually control, they can observe and they can experiment. And they can see what causes what, the cause and effect. You see, variables in that sense. Now, social scientists is much more difficult. 
Because how do you study something as big as economics? What causes a depression? My God, a depression is an incredible piece of phenomena. What causes it? There can be 20,000 variables that are causing a depression. Not 20,000 single variables, but 20,000 variables interacting on each other. You see? Which causes something more than either of the two. And so on. Anthropology or psychology. Why does a person act the way he does? Is there a simple solution to that? A person could do one particular kind of behavior because who knows what reason? You see? There could be 20 different reasons why he's doing one thing in terms of an interaction or system in his mind and so on. So therefore, the object of study is very different in social sciences than it is in natural sciences. In the social sciences, the object of study many times, first of all, is intangible. It cannot, you cannot put your finger on behavior. Put your finger on the unconscious mind. Put your finger on an instinct. But you can't put your finger on a light wave. You can measure it. There are things you can do. You see, you can't put your finger on, on a circuit or on a mechanical object, on a lever, you see, or on machines or something, or on electrical things. You can do that. You can measure it. The phenomena are tangible in the sense that they can be measured and observed in some way. And they can be predicted because the variables are much simpler and they can be controlled. In the social sciences, the phenomena essentially are intangible. You see, number one, you cannot put your finger on them, you cannot measure them really, they're not concrete. And number two, there are so many of them that you cannot really control them. So therefore, these sciences are really not considered emerson sciences, you see, in that kind of sense. There's an attempt, there's like all of these people, if you ever notice a book on any of these things, the first chapter is always concerned with the necessity of legitimizing itself <laughs> as a science. <laughs> You'll never see this in a book on physics. You see. They're trying to make it a success. Exactly. Like, yeah. like in, in this book on sociology, you'll always find the whole first chapter saying, why we can call ourselves Chachamim. You know, <laughs> we, we have the issues to call ourselves Chachamim. Because that's the problem. You know? Because since the phenomena are intangible, and the fact that there's so many, you take care of it, all. So how can you develop a chachma? How can you tell me what this, that this causes that? How do you know? You see, it's like the whole thing with the economy, for example. They want to figure out what causes inflation and what causes unemployment, and so on. And they figured out that generally, when, you know, employment, the causes of unemployment are the opposite of the cause of inflation. And then suddenly they see themselves with inflation and unemployment going up at the same time. And everyone's going wild. And they, they, can't, they don't know what to do. You see, that's, that's the whole situation. There are factors which are out of control. Okay, now, we can all say, that's nice, that's their problem. No, it's our problem. What do we mean our? It is the problem of an endless of ben I mean, not only ben When I mean a ben I don't mean it in the, the very minimal, provincial sense which we use. It is the problem of the one who sees the entire world through the eyes of Torah. Because somebody who sees the world in the eyes of Torah... Who is the mashkiach in the world? The Rabbani Shalom. All these sciences are legitimate sciences. Why? Because they all study phenomena which really exist. You see. But, and the Torah is also concerned with that. Who is the one who is making depressions and recessions and unemployment and inflation and all the stuff that goes? The Rabbani Shalom. Tashkoka Protest. Who, who is involved in creating the Indian of behavior of man? The Rabbani Shalom. Who determines the culture of different societies? The Rabbani Shalom. Or the different governments? For example, in 1776, in the 13th continent, in the 13th state, suddenly there arose a new kind of government called a democracy, which was very, un- almost unheard of before, until thousands of years, 2,000 years before in Greece, which is really a very poor example of it. And so on. You see, Tashkok Protest suddenly said that in this country will suddenly be zucha to this kind of government. Why? What, what, what has acted Tashkok determined this kind of thing? You see. So therefore, what we want to know is simply this. We also want to know what causes these phenomena. But we are not concerned to go in the route that all these people go. See? Because their route is very poor and very inexact. You see? How do, we, how do we understand the same thing that they're trying to understand? Well, first of all, they try and understand everything, not in terms of Ashkocha. They try and say that the cause of all these various different events, an economic event, is caused by another economic event. What economic event? We don't know. We have to sit down and figure it out in the next ten years. You see. But essentially that's what they say. They try and explain all the different things that happen on the basis of things which exist in this world. But 
as a, in terms of as a Tam Chacham, as a Benet Ben Torah, you realize that what goes on here is determined by the Hashkocha. Now the Shaila is, can we understand what really goes on? That's the question. To answer these questions is incredible. It's very difficult. How do you go explain why there's a depression? How do you actually do it? Well, that's one thing. But the point is, is that we therefore will attempt to do the same thing. We will understand to some degree, ultimately, what are the determining factors of these things mitzvah the Torah? So, there's something called secular economics and there's something called Torah economics. There's something called secular psychology and there's something called Torah psychology down the line. Do you all understand what I'm talking about? You see? That you cannot say most people are very immature in their attempt to deal with these sciences. For example, most people who sit and learn who are who know something about Torah say, Ah! Sheker! The Chazav! Shtut! Nashkeit! That's what they say. That's an incredible... It's, that's an incredible Sheker itself. Why? Because it may be true that a lot of the stuff in these Chachmas are Sheker. That's true. But the attempt to understand this stuff is not. Because you must understand the phenomena. If you don't want to understand in terms of this system, there must be some other system to explain the phenomena. The question is, how do we go about doing that? Well, the Torah does go about doing that. Now, you will see, for example, in the Gemara, that there are many things in the Gemara which you can more see apply to these different things. You see, for example, I'll give you one example, a small example. <coughs> Political science. Okay? Or, I'm sorry, one of the others, um, uh, there's another a very important one, history. Well, it's not really a science, it's a social science. In a sense, it is, but it's not technically a science. But we'll just put that's it a, on. That's, a, that's an exact thing. Well, the yeah, it's more exact. exact. Well, that's a question, not really. Cause, mm-hmm. No, not really. It depends, it depends who writes it. It depends how it's recorded. Well, recorded, yeah. yeah, it's not recorded. But even in history, it depends yeah. yeah. to understand what causes historical phenomena. You see, what causes wars. So whenever you look at I mean, all of us, anyone who's taken a course in, in American history in high school knows, give me 20 reasons for the Civil War, 13 reasons for World War I. You know, and so on, I mean, you know, all this kind of thing. Seven reasons why we call the American colonies rebelled against the British. As if these were the seven reasons.